Hey everybody, I just wanted to make a quick announcement before today's video. I recently launched channel memberships. Uh, if you guys haven't already seen, you can join by hitting the join button next to the subscribe button. Uh, and if you become a channel member, you will get access to special emotes and member badges during live streams. And more importantly, if you join at the $5 tier, you will get access to exclusive members-only reactions. I've already got a bunch of them uploaded to the channel, and I will con continue to release them monthly. So if you guys are interested in that, I would very much appreciate it if you become a channel member. Just hit that join button next to the subscribe button. Anyway, let's get back to today's video. Welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching History Resummarized, The Roman Empire by Overly Sarcastic Productions. Now, this video popped into my recommended uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's taken me a bit to get to it. I thought it sounded uh, pretty interesting. I haven't watched too much of Overly Sarcastic Productions videos before. I think I've watched some of their videos on, like, literary tropes and stuff like that, but not their history videos. Uh, so I'm curious to see how this one goes. I'm excited to get into it. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, please join as a channel member or check out the Patreon if that's more your speed. Anyway, let's get into this reaction. Ah, the Roman Empire. Established by the eternally baby-faced Augustus in 27 <laughs> BC, this innovation in governance placed one emperor in charge of the entire Roman state, which in turn ruled over the whole Mediterranean world for the next half millennia. As yes, it did. A very impressive innovation. And... I mean, I think you could say even longer if you count the Byzantine Empire, which, you know, that is just the continuation of the Roman Empire. It's the Eastern Roman Empire. But, you know, you're sort of counting until the fall of Rome. And I also liked uh, that they mentioned it was Augustus that founded this. Now, if they'd gotten that wrong, that would be a big problem. But I feel it is sort of commonly misunderstood. A lot of people think that Caesar was the first Roman emperor. No, he wasn't. Now, Caesar certainly laid the groundwork for what was to come. But after Caesar was gone, Augustus picked up where Caesar left off, and he was truly the first Roman emperor. Uh, I think Augustus is kind of an underrated historical figure. Whether or not you like him or however you judge him, you know, it's sort of impossible to ignore that he was super influential. And I feel like his influence is not recognized as much as someone like Caesar, for example. As the earlier history of the Republic has shown, Rome is a dense topic, but the ironic difficulty with Imperial Roman history is that the great Senatus Populusque Romanus had already hmm. won. At the death of Augustus, Rome stretched from Iberia- The Senate and the Roman people, that's SPQR. Iberia to Africa, the long way. <laughs> and hmm. while emperors did add a few more problems- <laughs> The long way. <laughs> I like that description. Uh, and they're pointing out something else that is absolutely true, which is- you know, the Roman Empire was only founded with Augustus, but before him, the Roman Republic, it was already an empire. Um, so I will refer to the Roman Republic as an empire, which I think is confusing to some people occasionally, but it absolutely was already an empire, even if there was no emperor at the top. ...provinces in the following centuries, this new age was not defined by conquests, but by the victorious quiet of the Pax Romana. Likewise, yes. the poets and artists of the Augustan era had codified a new imperial identity for Rome, stepping out of Greece's shadow to set the standard for Roman culture. With so much groundwork diligently laid in the centuries BC, imperial Rome in these first 200 years AD was at the top of its game, with nothing left to do but make the most lavishly glorious civilization they could. This I really like how they're laying this out. Yeah, the Roman Empire especially in its most prosperous early era, was not necessarily about conquest. There was a lot of conquest going on, but it was a lot about, one, maintaining what they had already conquered, and two, this flourishing era of prosperity, culture, and peace. And as the empire continues, and as some struggles emerge, the empire struggles to maintain control of its territory, you know, it's going to basically stop conquest entirely, and the empire will be completely focused on maintaining territory. This is something that was very much carried over to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. They were very much a defensive empire. They wanted to protect what they had, uh, and they often struggled to conquer more. In fact, they were sometimes focused on reconquering what they had lost. But uh, this is very true, and I like that they're pointing this out rather uncharacteristically calm state of affairs gives us an opportunity to look at the structure and breathtaking scale of the Roman world. Before, of course, everything starts to go wrong. Don't yeah. worry, we'll get there. So, <laughs> to see how Mediterranean society reached its peak under the rule of the Caesars, let's do some history. 
to begin with, we have... Uh, okay, we might need to get through some shenanigans first. Because hmm. when the Empire lacks in grand conflicts between civilizations, it makes up for in an absolute carousel of royal wackos. These monarchs generally lack the charm of Caesar or the cleverness of Augustus, and are instead best known for the nonsense they got up to in their abundant time away from their one job. This is very true. Uh, yeah, the Roman emperors, what a series of individuals, huh? There are some very talented people, uh, some very untalented ones, some psychopaths. There is a whole collection of people who would rule the Roman Empire. Uh, and, you know, Caesar and Augustus did kind of set the standard for those to follow, though many of their predecessors failed to follow that standard. Um, and Augustus very much represents sort of this issue that a lot of Roman emperors would have, which is the chaotic succession of the Roman Empire. Now, Caesar managed to get Augustus to su succeed him through uh, adopting Augustus, making Augustus his heir, Octavian at the time. So Caesar did find success. Uh, Augustus would struggle to find a worthy heir to his legacy. And a lot of rather talented emperors would really struggle to find heirs that would be able to continue their legacy and rule the empire skillfully. And so we see sort of a trend of good emperors, and then we have a couple of really terrible emperors. Uh, of course, this is sort of what happens when this is how your political system is designed, this is how your succession is designed. There's no concrete processes or systems here. Um, it's partially to do with luck, partially to do with who's in the right place at the right time, and partially to do with who is cunning and scheming enough to get their way to the top. Uh, particularly in later years. This all makes for excellent gossip, but the train wreck fascination runs thin by the time a fifth locomotive careens off the rails and crashes into the nearest chaos orgy. And frankly, <laughs> enough of these stories come to us from historians and senators with axes to grind and a culture that already loves exaggerating that it's just best not to dwell on them, which- This is true, Roman historians notoriously unreliable. Of course, they are our only sources for a lot of this info, so we have to use them, and they provide a lot of good information. But Roman historians were prone to just blatantly making stuff up, and they were very much prone to bias. Uh, if there was someone they liked, they would make them seem like the most impressive person in the world. If there was someone they didn't like, they would include every other rumor they heard about them. And so some of the worst emperors, um, we know that they were pretty bad, but a lot of the stuff we've heard is very much exaggerated. So we do have to take a lot of our sources here with uh, a massive pinch of salt. This is why I invite your imagination to run wild as I treat the emperors as glorified timestamps. So, the distressingly low That's what the Romans did. Augustus's heirs led to Tiberius landing on the throne, whereupon he holed up in his palace on the scenic Isle of Capri to enjoy the aforementioned Carnival of Orgies. His successor Caligula, whose name means li Yeah, Tiberius, he, he wasn't that bad. He wasn't that bad. I mean, especially compared to Caligula. Little Boots is remembered for antics like nominating his horse for consul to insult the Senate and sending an army to collect seashells off the coast of Gaul. But he started a few notable trends. More building projects, for one, but also concentrating more power on himself and, critically, being assassinated by his own guards in 41 AD. Now, this may have been yeah. useful in the- Well, you know, I think uh, good old Julius Caesar perhaps started that trend being assassinated by those who are apparently loyal to you. Um, but yes, Caligula transformed that into being assassinated by your own guards, and that will be a very common occurrence. In the short term, but it doesn't bode great for future emperors, so... The Praetorian Guard will gain a lot of power over the years, and this is a trend we see with a lot of sort of palace or royal guards. Uh, we see a similar thing with the Janissaries and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, these elite guards, they gain a lot of power, a lot of political power, and then they're able to leverage that over the emperor, who is, you know, supposed to have absolute power. But if you can't trust your own guards, then how much power can you really have? But we'll have plenty of time to discuss that later. At the moment, the Augustan reforms ensured that Roman armies didn't serve factions in the Senate or the personal whims of their generals, but the Emperor. And after the chaos of the late Republic, this setup lessened the threat of civil wars and let the army maintain the hard-won peace. By this point, the Roman military had reached peak form, or <laughs> at least peak aesthetic, and the 30-odd <laughs> legions were permanently stationed at the front. Yeah, definitely peak aesthetic. I mean, when we think about the Roman legionaries, 
I feel like this is sort of the period, the late Republic, early Empire that we think of. Frontiers of the Empire to project power beyond <laughs> Rome's borders. On paper, that's quite a contrast between this smooth operating in the provinces and the hijinks <laughs> of the royal palace, but by concentrating all of the crazy into one guy, the rest of the Empire could function without obstructions or conflict. I doubt that was the plan, but it seemed to work. I mean, there was a very effective Empire-wide bureaucracy that was set up and it functioned and governed very effectively. Now, a lot of this would break down over time. I mean, ask yourself, man, how did Europe fall into the Dark Ages? How did feudalism come about? Well, feudalism came about from the rotting corpse of the Roman Empire. Uh, a lot of these institutions would degrade over time. But at the moment, if we're talking about the early imperial period, yeah, there is a pretty high-functioning, effective bureaucracy uh, that even disinterested emperors like Tiberius or just bad nutjob emperors like Caligula, even if they personally are not good at the job, this bureaucracy, this government can mostly function without them. Now, like I said, a lot of this is going to change. <laughs> And it's here in the imperial era that the Roman world transformed from Italy's pile of provinces into an integrated Mediterranean system. Centered yeah. on the sea, they called Mare Nostrum, the low cost and high speed of seaborne transportation allowed goods, resources, and plenty of food to flow between port cities. Grain from North Africa, metals from Iberia, wines from Gaul, and scholars from <clears throat> Ephesus could be found in every corner of the empire and even far beyond. It's a really incredible system. I mean, we think about globalization today. And this is the ancient equivalent of that. It's really unprecedented, particularly if you think about the direction Europe was heading, how disconnected uh, the world was, how disconnected European countries were from one another, say, in the year 1000 AD, and then, you know, rewind back to the early Roman Empire. It's remarkable how you have the Middle East connected to the Italian peninsula, connected to the island of Britain, connected to Spain, connected to North Africa. And people are traveling in between them, trading in between all these provinces. Uh, it's really a remarkable feat of governance, of engineering, of trade, of economy. Um, I mean, the Roman Empire was truly an incredible achievement, regardless of what else you think about it. It's very impressive. As was often the case with Rome, commerce followed conquest as new provinces made for new and exciting sources of wealth and overland trade operated along the robust network of roads that was built to transport armies. This roadmap is one of the single most beautiful sites I've ever laid eyes on, and my wife Cyan is really pretty. And the part of does <laughs> Well, uh, okay, comparing the Roman road network to your wife, fair enough. I see, you know, I found a fellow admirer of Roman infrastructure. Uh, he clearly shares the passion uh, that I do for just the impressive infrastructure building engineering that the Roman Empire did. Doesn't stop there because lest we forget, the Romans were engineering maniacs. Yup. Concrete, domes, arches, water highways that ferry delicious H2O from the mountains down mm -hmm. into cities. I love this. You know, since this is such a general video about Rome, I feel like he's making and i'm getting to reiterate a lot of the points that i make in a lot of the videos we do on rome I, you know if you've seen my videos before you will know that i frequently talk about roman engineering you know i remember saying before uh, of the roman army you know if the roman army are fighting say 50 percent of the time which they're not they'd be building the other 50 percent of the time you know, they are building as much as they're fighting. The Roman army and Roman general was known for its infrastructure and its engineering, uh, as we can see from very impressive uh, photographs like this one on screen right now. Heated floors! The Romans literally had no chill when it came to construction. And this marks a distinction between the quiet vibrance of private art and the big public works, where they never mm. built a thing for the sake of its beauty, but rather for the sake of their glory. The true Roman artists were the engineers, who built not only temples and theaters, but roads, bridges, aqueducts, and baths. It's a practical, functional artistry where the beauty lies in the accomplishment and its usefulness to the empire, and the fact that they are also beautiful is a flourish. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not one of these return to tradition type individuals, but I gotta say, I do really love classical architecture and neoclassical architecture, and I do kind of miss, you know, building these massive monuments and buildings, one, for the use of the public, for the sake of public benefit, that's awesome, 
and, and two for the pure beauty of them alone um you know i do i personally like both of those things and i think the romans were really good at that a really big one to illustrate a few converging themes, let's look at the single greatest monument to Roman extravagance, the Colosseum. This neighborhood of the city had burned down in 64 AD, swiftly mm -hmm. to be replaced with a palace for the exceptionally crazed Emperor Nero, and then replaced a- Yep, of course there were a lot of accusations that Nero had burned that section of the city down. I don't believe it's true, um, but yes, he was, uh, he was a crazy guy. <laughs> he definitely took advantage of that section of burned down city to build himself a, an impressive, impressive palace, like they said. Again, by the new emperor of Vespasian, the victor in a brief but fierce four-way civil war after Nero's death. Vespasian's plan- Yeah, Vespasian is more of a good emperor. You, you see the swing back and forth, someone like Nero, who is a nut job, to someone like Vespasian, who is uh, certainly a talented uh, military commander, and was pretty talented all around. Plan to legitimize his new Flavian dynasty was essentially to bribe the Roman people with the grand public project and the promise of splendid games in said arena once it was done. <laughs> this Herculean accomplishment relied not just on Rome's wealth, talents, and technologies like concrete, but on an imperial system specifically designed to make these projects possible. State-owned stone quarries and brickyards produced standardized building materials which could be used for whatever the emperor needed, and as far as Rome was concerned, slavery was just as vital to Rome's growth, development, and success. As every stage of buildings like the Colosseum relied in part on slave labor. First yeah, and that is definitely worth remembering. I mean, a lot of this is sort of glorifying the Roman Empire and some of its impressive achievements, uh, and I'm definitely a fan of those, but, um, you know, a, a fan sort of of how impressive they were, but, you know, if we think of this on a moral level, not to make moral judgments of people that lived thousands of years ago, but it is worth remembering the slavery that played a role in building all of this the brutality of a lot of the conquests, you know, this is stuff that we have to keep in mind when, you know, accu accurately looking at a full picture of the history. First in the mines, quarries, and brickyards, then in working alongside freedmen and day laborers to actually build these mega works. And once the Colosseum was finished, slaves fought in the arena to the delight of tens of thousands. Somewhere around a quarter of the empire's population was enslaved and treated like property. From the fields to the cities, the institution of slavery permeated every aspect of Roman society. And, and I feel like this is something that is sort of underreported on about these ancient societies. Um, you know, like Rome and ancient Greece. Because this is, as Westerners, say, Europeans or the descendants of Europeans in, for example, the United States or Canada or whatever, you know, we think about, say, Rome and Greece as sort of our cultural heritage, our lineage. Uh, Western culture sort of dates back. So a lot of this very much gets glorified, and I feel like we do sometimes forget the role that, you know, stuff like slavery played in this. Slavery was extremely prevalent in Rome. Same with, for example... Ancient Athens. Ancient Athens is often used as a shining example of democracy. Uh, you know, real direct democracy, uh, and we can take notes from it, and, and, and that's fine, but you also have to remember it was a slave society. So once again, this stuff is worth remembering, and I'm very glad they're bringing it up. The potential cognitive dissonance between Rome's accomplishments and the cruelty of its methods was of distressingly minimal concern to the Roman people, as the Colosseum <laughs> itself shows how casually Romans went to a magnificent theater for the sole purpose of watching people get f***ing body. Gladiatorial matches were the most notorious of festivities, but there were also beast hunts, chariot races, and, when they were feeling bold, entire naval battles, all Holy. of which could be themed and choreographed to represent famous stories from history and myth. I didn't know that. That is crazy. Yeah. Even when celebrating peace, the Romans loved a violent spectacle. Yeah. Zooming back out, let's... Yeah, and to be honest, I know this seems very shocking to a lot of us, but I kind of think that if you brought something like that back today, of course it would be completely illegal, blah, 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 but a lot of people would be very interested to see, uh, and a lot of people would probably enjoy it. So, you know... Don't look back on our ancestors with too much disdain. Um, you know, you should judge them and judge them fairly. But to be honest, <laughs> I think a, a lot of people today aren't so different than people back then. You know, we're still people. Uh, a lot of things haven't changed. And a lot of people do take delight in the suffering of others. 
So, eh, that's kind of worth keeping in mind. Let's jump northwest to Britannia, where Emperor Claudius' first foray into the Isle was later consolidated by Agricola, the governor who conquered Wales and northern England during the reign of Vespasian. Britannia was one of the few provinces added during the Imperial Era, and while its capital of Londinium was not a major metropolis of the Roman world, it does show us how fast Rome could plop down roots and establish a fully functioning city out of what seems like thin air. And while yeah. the city of Rome looks like an urban planner's nightmare, their later editions are planned so well it's insulting to the rest of us yeah i mean that's exactly right rome itself because it was so old and had naturally grown over time it was not planned super well but you know later on when the romans would plop down cities in places like londinium london um they were very good at this these grid-based cities planning and of course when the united states was founded uh, our founders very much took inspiration from rome in many ways their politics um, their society, and one of the things they liked about Rome was that grid system. And so, a lot of American cities, a lot of American states, if you look at states and their counties, are based on a grid system because it's you know more logical, more easy to understand, uh, easy to build around. Um, and so, this was taken from the Romans. Ah, the grids. Beautiful. And Roman mm. Britain is surprisingly well documented because Agricola's son-in-law was the historian Tacitus. His account ah. of Britannia gives us a good look at how the Romans saw conquered peoples, not treating them with any particular warmth, but very inclined to keep things running smoothly. A common strategy was to designate client kingdoms to preserve the local order within the broader aegis of Rome's authority. This could be done on its own, or made as a first step before direct Roman administration, or instead done to pacify a frontier with a light touch of diplomacy rather than throwing legions at. Most yeah, these are very good points. Sometimes the Roman borders could be a little fuzzy because of, you know, what was directly controlled by Rome versus client kingdoms versus kingdoms that we have, say, treaties with. Um, you know, Rome had a lot of control even outside its official borders. Um, and the other point they made about, you know, Rome not necessarily treating uh, these new people to the empire too badly you know, this is sort of uh, born out of necessity. If you look at any land empire, um, say the Ottomans, they're another good example. In order to expand as fast as they did, just like Rome, there has to be some degree of toleration. You have to be able to tolerate other peoples, their culture, their religion, um, and, you know, sort of assimilate them into your empire. And this is what the Romans were so good at. They were very good at tolerating other kinds of people. Uh, they were fine with other religions. They would bring other religions into their own pantheon. They would assimilate people. So they would allow people to keep some of, you know, their cultural stuff, their religious stuff. And then they would also assimilate them into the Roman way of life. Of course, the Roman way of life was pretty diverse and it could mean many things. And so the Romans were very good at being somewhat tolerant of other groups while also assimilating them uh, into the Roman way. And of course, this is sort of the only way that a massive land empire like that can function. Most cultural transmission between the Romans and their new subjects involved the barbaric party taking on Roman customs to become more civilized, but the diversity yep. of cultures within the empire produced a wide variety yep. of what it meant to be Roman. As exactly. Rome was in turn influenced by local language, art, dress, and most crucially, religion. Having more mm -hmm. or less copy-pasted their entire pantheon, Rome had no trouble seeing opportunities for crossover between cultures and doing DBZ fusions on similar <laughs> deities. Yep, I mean, that's exactly what I was just saying. Uh, and they also pointed out that the Roman pantheon is basically just copied from the Greek pantheon. So clearly the Romans had no issue with incorporating other religious traditions, and they would continue to do this. This is not... I mean, of course, until the rise of Christianity, um, and Christianity was far less tolerant of other religions and other views on religion. Not how Rome treated Judaism. For mm -hmm. one, Judaism was pointedly non-polytheistic, but it also didn't help that Rome and the province of Judea had a frequently adversarial relationship. Yeah. After a bloody conquest by Pompey, a string of oppressive governors tightened the screws on Judea until a revolt broke out in 66 AD, whereupon Vespasian delegated the war to his son and soon-to-be emperor, mm -hmm. Titus. Jerusalem was ultimately sacked and looted as the commemorative Arch of Titus shows legionaries carting off a giant menorah, and the Jews went into diaspora after the destruction of the Second Temple. There yeah, so, once again, I'm talking about the relative toleration of the Roman Empire. Keep in mind the brutality of conquest, and sometimes that brutality could be turned on residents of the Empire. The Jews are a good example. 
Uh, this is also a good example that, you know, the Jews have really had it tough since they were around. You know, they've been continually mistreated. Um, you know, the Romans had issues with Jews partially because of their exclusionary religious beliefs. Of course, if you believe in Judaism, it's not like a polytheistic pantheon. You know, there's the one and only God. The Romans didn't like that. Um, and then also there was the Jewish political. So the, the Romans had issues with the Jews and brutalized them many times. Um, and then with the rise of Christianity, you might hope since Christianity and Judaism, they're both, uh, you know, of the book and they're pretty similar in many ways. You might hope that the Jews got a better deal, but they really didn't. They continued to have a, a pretty hard time up through the present, frankly. Um, so that's, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's how Jewish history has been. There are faint echoes of this in how Rome treated Christianity, another mm -hmm. monotheistic religion considered subversive to the empire. But for these first two centuries, persecution of Christians was only a sporadic and localized concern. Now, whether it was... Yeah, I mean, Christianity was not really a big deal at this point. Um, and like they said, persecution of Christians was very sporadic because Christianity wasn't that popular. Uh, Christians were kind of seen as these cultist weirdos. And sometimes they would get arrested or persecuted or certain emperors like to, to brutalize Christians. But it wasn't really a big thing because Christianity itself wasn't really a big thing at this point. It was karma for Jerusalem or just bad luck, Titus got hit by twin crises during his brief two years as emperor. In addition to another fire in Rome, he had to pick up the soot-covered pieces after Mount Vesuvius went kaplooey on the entire Bay of Naples. After he died, yeah. his brother became emperor, continuing some trends and resuming others from earlier, like more big building projects after the fire, more power stripped away from the Senate, and more getting assassinated. This time, <laughs> the Praetorian Guard further bullied the new emperor Nerva to adopt the general Trajan as his heir. And for all the inherent corruption that led us to this point this is where things start really getting shiny trade i mean look yeah this process has taken a lot of corruption a lot of threats a lot of violence uh but hey trajan was a good choice <laughs> you know i don't necessarily agree with the processes that were taken to get us here but if someone had to come out at the end as emperor yeah, Trajan's a good option. Trajan was a military master who pushed Roman territory to its fullest extent and built a triumphal column to commemorate how dope his conquest of Dacia was. The Dacia, modern day Romania. The Dacians, or as it is actually pronounced in Latin, the Dacians, well, they're, uh, you know, modern day Romanians. I mean, there's a lot of mixing, but if you track the descendants, uh, that's what modern day Romania traces its roots back to the Dacians. And then, of course, they were integrated into the Roman Empire. I mean, how do you think the country got the name Romania, right? The spoils of this newly subjugated province paid for yet more public works, including the last and grandest forum in Rome, complete with two libraries. Yeah, and it brought in massive amounts of wealth. I mean, that's why he, you know, the column was able to be built, Trajan's column, celebrating the conquest, because of all the wealth that the conquest brought to the empire. And this is a pleasant running theme for this century. Anyone can spend money on their own palaces, but only a real G gives it back to his people. Yeah, the Trajan's conquest of Mesopotamia was impressively flashy, but completely untenable, and his successor Hadrian had no interest in more outward expansion. Now Hadrian, Hadrian was another good emperor. You know, we're getting to the rare span of good emperors within the Roman Empire. Uh, Trajan was a conqueror. Uh, he very impressively expanded the territory of the empire. Hadrian, he was sort of unique at this point. Uh, perhaps he could see the future. He knew what was coming. Hadrian just wanted to maintain what had already been conquered. Hadrian uh, was good at governing the empire, and he was good at maintaining and securing the territory that they already had. Um, so depending on your personality type, I can see how you'd favor one over the other. Um, you know, the aggressive conquering Trajan or the, the more conservative defensive Hadrian, um, but both very good emperors in their own right. Instead, focusing on fortifying Britannia and Germania and otherwise splashing money on monuments around the empire. Rome yeah. hadn't completely given up hope of walloping its enemies, as even the philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius spent 14 long years begrudgingly waging war against the increasingly pesky Germans. The good emperors, uh... You know, we're not going to see <laughs> this uh, sort of series of impressive leaders again in the Roman Empire. Marcus Aurelius famously wrote Meditations, a uh, very important book in Western philosophy. Um, you know, we're getting some very impressive figures here. You know, we're getting conquerors, those who were able to govern and protect the empire, famous philosophers. I mean, my goodness. 
But I think this is about when the practical reality finally set in. Mm. All the rich or easy borderland territories had already been taken, so the strategy of conquer everything that looks at you funny was no longer viable, and this is where Rome topped out. That's yeah. far from terrible, as these last three of the so-called good emperors presided over a Rome at the absolute height of its power and prosperity, and there's plenty to respect in several decades of pleasantly quiet history characterized by wise rulers and a steady empire. I mean, this is really the height of the Roman Empire, 117 through 180. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, and we can go a little before and a little after, basically a century of prosperity uh, and relative peace for the citizens of Rome. Things will rather quickly deteriorate, but I mean, this is the height of the Roman Empire. Uh, I mean, it's been going pretty well up until this point. Um, you know, you have the, the early days of Augustus, but this is probably the highest we've gotten since the time of Augustus. But, and remember now, we're talking about Rome here. It won't be long until the Romans' legendary discipline starts to lapse and things go ouch, because the great yeah. SPQR always maintained the potential for a remarkably precipitous drop. But for <laughs> now, there wasn't a better time to inhabit beautiful cities, to enjoy brilliant engineering, to prosper from expansive trade, and to live in a secure society. It wasn't always the best, but it was Roman civilization at its best. And honestly, doing our best is all we should ask. Wow. When discussing now, honestly, now I, I know s there are some arguments about the Dark Ages that came following the collapse of Rome, and some people say, well, they weren't that bad. And while obviously I don't think they were as bad as some people make them out to be, well, let's be honest with ourselves: the Dark Ages were pretty bad. <laughs> you know, pretty bad for most people, um, and it was definitely a fall from the height of the Roman Empire. I mean, just be honest with yourself. Look at how you know impressive this is. The trade networks, the road networks, uh, the level of prosperity, the level of connectedness, uh, the impressiveness of the governance, um, all of that. And then compare it to what was to come, say, hundreds of years later uh, in the Dark Ages. I mean, it's quite a fall from grace. Uh, I think even if you're one of those who wants to sort of reorient our view of the Dark Ages uh, and argue that they weren't as bad as been believed... Uh, there's certainly some truth to that, but it was definitely a fall from this point. Seeing the history of Rome, it's only natural to come across a handful of points at which things seem to go very wrong. War here, plague there, civil war over here, another general marches his army on Rome, and after a certain point it doesn't even register. But these are all fairly momentary crises. A bad time, to be sure, but ultimately a self-contained catastrophe. Yet there is one truly abysmal chapter in Roman history that takes the cake. A quintuple barrel calamity for the ages. And no, I'm not talking about the Byzantines because I am not looking to to cry today, I'm talking about the <laughs> crisis of the 3rd century, which, oh, yeah. by every reasonable prediction, should have destroyed everything. Fully yeah. ev everything went wrong. Uh, I'm excited to get into this. I'm really enjoying this video. Um, I've been talking a lot. It's going to take us a long time to get through this. Everything. Yet, in a classic twist of Roman irony, the causes of this crisis and even a few of its symptoms would become the strategies used by Roman emperors to end the crisis and even keep Rome going for centuries to come. So let's take a look to find out how on earth that is possible. The Roman Empire entered the 200s AD in an iffy state. The golden age of the last century was losing some of its shine thanks to a succession of truly garbage emperors, starting with Commodus the Gladiator Tyrant and not getting much better. Aye, but beyond aye. the scandalous hedonism of emperors with more concubines than sense lay far more dangerous habits, like how Alexander Severus bought the loyalty of larger and larger armies by ballooning their pay. Yep, and this is going to be a massive problem. The army keeps growing. And, you know, now that the emperor is at the top, we've already mentioned how their position can be threatened by the Praetorian Guard. It can also be threatened by the military. The military is the most important institution in the Roman Empire. And so these emperors, as time goes on, have to keep giving bigger bonuses to the army to please them. Now, you know, that's all good and dandy until the empire starts running out of money. This also contributes to massive inflation. Um... So the empire running out of money, massive inflation, the army increasingly getting more and more uppity, the empire or the emperor becoming less secure in his position. You know, these are a couple of trends that will definitely contribute to the fall 
of the West. To afford this, he debased the currency by mixing the gold and silver with plebby dork metals, which tanked their value. And far from- And that's what I mean by inflation. Now, if you're wondering, well, what do you mean by inflation at this time period? Well, it's called debasement. What happens is, say you have gold coins, right? This is the Roman currency. Now, you want to pay the military more and more and more. You want their bonuses to get bigger and bigger, or they're going to storm the capital and murder you. But you don't have any more gold to pay them. So what do you do? Well, instead of having a gold coin that's 100% gold, what if you had a gold coin that was, mm, I don't know, 95% gold? That's 5% less. Maybe you can afford that. And so you use that to pay your men. Over time, <laughs> as this trend continues, the next emperor goes, well, what if the coins were only 90% gold? And then 85, and then 80, and then we... I don't know what the lowest point is, but we get to an exceptionally low point where the coins are something like 20% gold, maybe less. Uh, and of course, that's what inflation is. Uh, the currency becomes virtually worthless. And this was a massive, massive problem. Uh, that really contributed to the fall of the empire. From actually protecting Rome, this dynamic just gave the army leverage. In the old Augustan days, legions served at the pleasure of the emperor, but now the emperor was just some guy who wore purple, and yep. if Commodus could get strangled to death in a bath by his wrestling buddy, the bar mm -hmm. for intimidating, puppeting, or just replacing an emperor was like five Praetorian guards. But then whomst to replace him with? Why, one of the generals, of course. And this was the same basic trick that Sulla and Caesar had pulled, but it saved the legwork of marching an army on Rome. E Efficiency. So in the 50 years since the first guy got axed, over 20 such barracks emperors took their brief turn at the top. These guys weren't the most legitimate, since they conspicuously weren't the children or legal heirs of the previous emperor. Yeah, I mean, we already talked about how Roman succession was basically a disaster, because there was no concrete system. And when you have no concrete system of succession, whether it's a dynastic system or elections or appointment by some council, you run into issues like this, where for a really extended period of time, uh, and this will be a trend that will last through the Roman Empire, through the Byzantine Empire, we have a lot of these upstart emperors who the military is upset with the current emperor, uh, they raise this random general to the position of emperor, they march on the capital, murder the current guy, and now this general is emperor, and then he's gonna get murdered a year later. You know, this is not a very stable way to govern an empire. It leads to a lot of problems. Emperor, but hey, you're the emperor! Never mind that another general two provinces over is taking notes on how you got <laughs> to that point. You'll be fine! Yeah. For a few months. All it took was some general beating up some goths for their soldiers to say, great job, you should be the emperor, and then they get ideas, and suddenly there's a mini civil war to sort out. And mm -hmm. all the squabbling left the door wide open for Rome's rivals beyond the frontier to come right on in. Which frontier, you may ask? Good question. All of them. In the good old days, <laughs> Germania was the primary ouch zone, but now the entire north was subject to incursions, from the Rhine all the way across the Danube, with fun new friends like Franks, Marcomanni, Goths, and plenty others. Yeah, this is going to be the problem. Your empire continues to get weaker with all of this chaos. You can't have an emperor for more than a couple of months. Uh, and of course, selecting emperors this way does not lead necessarily to the selection of the best men. So you have a bunch of random generals in power, and then all of these tribes, the Vandals, the Goths, are getting more and more powerful. They're consolidating power. More of them, them are moving in west, settling. They're getting more powerful. You're getting weaker. We're getting a lot of problems now. Some of these migrations were simply people looking for new lands to settle, while others were significantly more forceful. Terrifyingly, they also sailed down the Atlantic coast and into the Eastern Sea, striking as far as Athens in 267. The Roman army was good, but it wasn't that good. When an emperor focused on one area, another was left wide open, but when the emperor tried to delegate, he might find his trusty general scheming for that big promotion. Meanwhile, mm. the eastern frontier was also a nightmare. <laughs> the Parthians had been a sore spot for Rome since Moneybags Crassus was defeated and <laughs> Taxidermied with gold back in 53 BC, but Parthia yep. rarely went on the offensive. They were just hard to conquer, so all of Rome's failed campaigns were essentially self-inflicted. However, the newly formed Sassanid Persian Empire... Yep, the Persians haven't been a threat for a while, but from now on, <laughs> the Persians are going to become the arch nemesis, particularly of the Byzantine Empire. These two empires will be at each other's throats for hundreds of years. The Sassanids present uh, a massive challenger to Rome, particularly Eastern Rome. 
uh, until, of course, they are conquered by the Muslims with the formation of the early caliphate. But, I mean, we have got literally hundreds and hundreds of years until that point. But, yeah, the Persians are coming back. And you'll also notice we have groups like the Goths and the Franks who will become many of the groups um, that will rule Europe after the fall of Rome. Yeah, that's how you know that we're sort of getting to a downwards period when you start seeing groups like the Franks and you go, wait a minute, aren't they around after the Romans? Yes, they are. Empire, which took their place in the 220s, was much more of an outward threat. In the 250s, King Shapur I pushed into Armenia, Roman Mesopotamia, and briefly into the Levant. Assassinated Menace would become a running theme for the next few centuries, but it came out of the gate yep. real fast in the mid-200s. In 260, they captured Emperor Valerian in battle, whereafter the king used him as a footstool, as if mm -hmm. the emperor wasn't bad enough already. Well, these are rumors, of course, um, probably exaggerated, but does show you sort of how humiliated the Romans felt by this. Let's not limit our sample size. It was miserable to be any kind of Roman nowadays. We've got coins getting debased throughout the century to bribe the army, trade routes constantly disrupted by war, and entire regions being destroyed by invasions and counterattacks. Yeah, it's starting to get really bad for everybody. And now, we still have about 200 years until the western portion of the empire falls. But if you're paying attention, I feel like you can already see the descent into the Dark Ages, into the Medieval Ages. Currency's becoming worthless, everything's becoming more dangerous. <laughs> um, as the Empire loses control over its territory, local elites start to, you know, raise up, become more autonomous, uh, have more power over their local provinces. You know, all of this eventually leads to feudalism, serfdom, local lords and vassals. Um, so you can really see a lot of these trends begin, well, before this point, but they're really coming to light at this point. Plus, a plague in the 250s killed thousands a day in Rome and whittled cities like Alexandria down to half, which in turn drastically reduced the labor force available to farm and fight, resulting in widespread food and soldier shortages. As mm. if the actual wars weren't enough of a problem, piracy within the empire was rampant, so cities and provinces spent what little resources they had on defensive walls and small forts along major roads. Uh, here we go. Another trend that we can see how this moves into medieval Europe. Uh, before this point, you know, a lot of Roman cities actually didn't have defensive walls. There's no reason for them, you know? what? Well, you're part of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's extremely secure, extremely well guarded. Your city doesn't need walls. At this point, with all this chaos brewing, a lot of these cities start building walls around their cities, start building forts. And now this is starting to look a lot more like medieval Europe with walled cities and fortresses and castles. And that's where all of that begins. All of this made clear that the society enjoyed during the Pax Romana was long gone, as it required the stability of strong government and a strong military, both of which were fully absent here in the 200s. Mm. Functions of government were carried out primarily by the army, who were only accountable to their very stabbable general. Luckily, yep. when Rome worked, it worked. So if those political and military foundations could be patched up, at least on a local level, things could be alright. Yeah, now don't get me wrong. Uh, the Empire is going to recover from the crisis of the 3rd century. The Empire will recover, and it will continue for 200 more years. Um, it's not like we're immediately dropping into the Dark Ages. I want to make that clear. I'm just saying that a lot of these trends, even though they will be patched up by some very impressive emperors, you can sort of see where we're heading in the long term. Now, believe it or not, the first three decades of the crisis were actually rather straightforward and even a bit tame compared to what went down after 260. Valerian being captured by Persia left Rome to his son and co-emperor Gallienus. Faced with the problem of everything everywhere all of the time, he was happy to delegate the Rhineland frontier to Posthumus, a general mm -hmm. and governor of Roman Germania. Naturally, it took all of five minutes for Posthumus to be claimed <laughs> as emperor, but not for all of Rome, just yep. the western provinces. Gallienus couldn't really do anything about about this, so Posthumus had free reign to form a quasi-independent state in the West that stretched from Britannia through Gaul and Germania and down into Hispania. He and this is another trend that's going to continue uh, through the Roman Empire, uh, the split into East and West. Sometimes the Empire will be split into more than two sections, but of course the enduring split is East and West. I mean, when the West falls, the East remains, the Eastern Roman Empire, or as we call it, the Byzantine Empire. 
created parallel Roman institutions like the Senate and consuls and had no intention of causing trouble with the rest of Rome, he just wanted his slice, and he was mm -hmm. able to defend it fairly well. Meanwhile, a strikingly similar story plays out on the other end of the empire, where Prince Odonathus of Palmyra fought mm -hmm. back against King Shapur and began acting independently of the new Emperor Gallienus. Roman trusted Odonathus with defense of the east and granted him governorship of the provinces of Cilicia and Syria down to Arabia. With only the eastern front to worry about, Odonathus held off the Sassanids until his assassination in 267 when his widow Zenobia became the de facto ruler of Palmyra and governor of all those provinces. Like in the west, this Palmyrene territory was essentially an independent state allied to Rome rather than provinces within it, and Rome was too occupied to really complain until 270 when Zenobia took advantage of a couple quick emperor deaths. Yeah, she sort of overstepped her bounds. Um, I mean, like, she was uh, aggressive. Uh, she wanted to conquer. Um, but once Rome had recovered a little bit, the emperor was not too happy. That's to annex Egypt and Galatia and proclaim her son as Imperator Caesar Augustus, which we can now fairly categorize as open revolt. Even <laughs> then, the new emperor only cared that Egyptian grain exports stayed on schedule, and it's painfully telling that he could see part of his empire in a state of active rebellion and still think, eh, I'll double back to that one later. I have more immediate problems. Plus, half of Egypt was in favor of their annexation. It seems weird, but you can see why. The Palmyrene Empire and the Gallic Empire were smaller, more nimble, yep. more stable, and slightly less susceptible to upstart barracks emperors. It just felt good to know that the person in charge was only one province over rather than halfway across the sea mm -hmm. and probably in the process of getting murdered by his own guards. Yeah, I'm very glad they're making this point. This is exactly what I would say uh, and will say. Um, though this does hearken the eventual breakup of the empire, it's also sort of the empire evolving for the times. You know, the empire can no longer to can no longer afford to be this massive unitary empire governed by one individual. With all these crises and chaos and raids, it's just not going to work. These provinces need someone in charge closer to them that can coordinate defense and military action. And so, I mean, we see the Palmyran and the the sort of western segment of the empire this trend will continue in many different forms the empire will be broken up in many different ways but the essential idea of we need to break up the empire between different executives who can govern over a smaller portion so that they can adequately defend it this idea is going to stick uh, and like i said you know the biggest example of that is the fact that the eastern roman empire survived the fall of the west for, God, more than a thousand years, basically. Really, the actions of Posthumus and Zenobia showed that they did work in the interest of Rome, just their corner of Rome, independently, and with the power of an emperor. Both states paid consistent homage to Rome, and despite how bad it looks on a map, were far less of a problem for the emperor than his own usurping generals, and even, arguably, a help, as they each removed mm -hmm. an entire front from the emperor's to-do list. And this wildly set the stage for their later conquest, as the emperor Aurelian was free to focus the first few years of his reign squarely on fighting rival usurpers and barbarians along the Danube and, uh-oh, in Italy. In 271, mm. he drove the Alemanni tribe out of the peninsula and built a new system of walls around Rome. He also organized a retreat from the always slightly untenable province of Dacia, making the much more defensible Danube River the consistent imperial border. Aurelian bringing Rome back. With the northern front temporarily settled, he turned east, defeating Zenobia and reconquering the Palmyrene territories by the end of 273, and then the next year he schlepped west to reincorporate the Gallic state. To the Empire's collective astonishment, Aurelian had reunified Rome under the singular authority of the Emperor in just a few years. Aurelian, I feel like another underrated Emperor. Uh, we should definitely discuss his achievements more. And was granted the title of Restitutor Orbis. <laughs> no small praise. With the world restored, he turned his focus to reform of the state, but we're not out of the woods yet because Aurelian got murdered by his own troops. In yeah. the decade following, things were definitely better, but still kind of crap, with uncomfortably squishy emperors, a non-functioning economy, and more Frankish invasions in the 270s. But more people presented a new opportunity, and Rome essentially employed them in the reconstruction of devastated cities and farmland in exchange for letting them stay. This practice becomes quite a big deal in later centuries. Mm -hmm. So in the 250s and 60s, the empire spiraled out of control, and the 270s saw big progress, but the 280s and 90s are when Roman authority finally came back, during the reign and reforms of Diocletian. After it's honestly remarkable that even at this point, uh, I mean, the empire is recovering, but you can clearly see the empire's decline. 
the amount of talent that the Roman Empire clearly had to draw from. I mean, Diocletian, there's an impressive emperor. Aurelian's very impressive. We have some impressive emperors to go. The, the talent pool is remarkable. After his acclamation as emperor in 284, he issued more stable currency, firmly separated military and civil leadership to stop yep. the army. And this is something that was very important. Uh, separate, uh, you know, the governance of provinces from military uh, affairs, right? <laughs> and so this makes politics and the governance of those provinces a lot more secure. Um, because you don't have to worry about politics and military affairs getting all tangled up. Now, throughout Roman history, politics and military affairs have always been tangled up. Um, but at this point, it's clearly causing a lot of issues. So I think Diocletian was exactly right to move it in this direction. Army muscling in on the state and moved the western seat of government up to Mediolanum to better oversee the front while he took up residence in the eastern city of Nicomedia. Yeah, and this is also, we see the decline of Rome, the city, not the empire, the city. Uh, they've already built more defensive walls around Rome, the city. Uh, now it's not even the capital of the West anymore. And the emperor's out east in Nicomedia. Uh, we sort of see the rise of the East uh, at this time. A lot of, once again, a lot of trends that will come to fruition in later years. The East is becoming more important. Nicomedia, you know, soon will get the most important city of the East, Constantinople. Um, and even in the West, the city of Rome is becoming less important. We'll see a couple, a couple of capitals out West, Ravenna the most important, but the city of Rome itself is still symbolically important, but politically and militarily less important. Further, he delegated regional authority to his most capable officers and made his General Maximian co-emperor in 286. Two yep. emperors wasn't a new idea, but by placing Maximian in charge of the West and Diocletian taking the East, this arrangement looked awfully similar to the business with Gaul and Palmyra, except this time it was intentional and formalized by intermarrying the families, which also created a line of legitimate succession. Yes. And now we will see changes to this split, but this is basically the East-West split that will continue through the collapse of the West into the Byzantine Empire. This is it. It's going to change over time and there will be some reunification, blah, blah, blah. It's complicated, but we are now basically seeing the split of the Empire into two parts. In 293, he expanded this setup by adding two junior co-emperors, known as Caesars, to support the two senior Augusti. This mm -hmm. tetrarchy kept Diocletian firmly at the top, but each emperor had regional autonomy. By re and also, this is, you know, I mentioned earlier how I think Augustus is underrated compared to Caesar. Caesar, in this case, is the junior position. Augustus is the senior position, sort of showing the importance of each figure here. Recognizing that Rome tended to split along geographic fault lines, Diocletian's diet federalism turned a perennial problem hmm. into a stabilizing strength. He also yeah. snuffed the threat of civil wars by cutting all the provinces in half, so each of the hundred governors had a clearer responsibility and less power to stand up against his local tetrarch. He Once again, evolving with the time. This is a lot easier to govern. The empire split into four, now there's uh, an emperor or sort of a semi-emperor in each of these four chunks. They can better defend. And also the provinces, now there's more of them, they're smaller. They can be governed and defended a lot easier. Th this is what had to happen. But of course, <laughs> this is also very much contributing to the eventual breakup of the entire empire. He also also grouped these new small provinces into 12 regional dioceses to really layer the strata onto government. So in an insanely trolley twist of fate, the Gallic and Palmyrene breakaway empires were a trial run of what Diocletian would make official policy. Rome yeah. was too fragile for one emperor, so take it in parts. It was no Pax Romana, and even the Tetrarchy would be temporary, but it was enough. Diocletian's reform- Yeah, the Tetrarchy will be- temporary uh it, it will be broken we'll, we'll see reunification but like i said this idea this trend will come back it was made a difference where they so diocletian was clearly right i mean if you're looking at it uh with retrospects you know 2020 vision we're looking at it from our perspective diocletian uh he clearly had an eye for the future because what he did is what will endure in the long term. Counted and brought Rome out of the crisis on a much more stable footing than they ever could have hoped for two decades earlier. I think people get excited about Rome for the wrong reasons. Mm. Rome conquered this, oh, they conquered that. Those are all whatever. What's impressive are the moments when Rome stares into the pale face of death and tells him to wait his goddamn turn. 
I totally agree with this. I mean, I do think the conquest and all that stuff is impressive and exciting too, as just a history nerd. But I agree. Uh, I think the more impressive, fascinating part about the Roman Empire is how it managed to evolve and adapt over time. Uh, and this is why, you know, we have the fall of the West, but a lot of Roman legacy, traditions, and institutions remain, um, even in the West, but of course in the East with the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, that's why it's sort of kind of a little fuzzy when Rome actually fell, <laughs> because Rome has changed so much over time that a lot of Roman stuff whether it be institutions, military, governance, culture, traditions, religion, it remains for a really long time after we, you know, think that Rome has technically fallen. Because no civilization could veto their own demise quite like Rome, and there's no greater refusal than the crisis of the 3rd century. To suffer five chaotic decades, but then learn from chaos itself to adapt the empire and come out on top. Rome yeah. would die, but not yet. The beautiful city of Rome is great to visit year-round because you can see all four seasons. Winter, spring, summer, fall... Oh no! <laughs> There's a lot to unpack with the fall of Rome. Going mm. from one of the greatest civilizations in human history to not existing at all is quite a long ways to drop. So questions of why it happened, when, and even if are hot... Yes, why it happened, when it happened, and if it happened. He's very much touching on what I just mentioned, sort of how fuzzy <laughs> the fall of Rome actually is when you really look at it. We debated, and the academic discourse starts to sound like a game of Clue. It was the mm. Vandals with the sack in 455. No, <laughs> stupid, it was Constantine with the Christianity in 312. Uh, clearly it was the Ottomans with the cannons in 1453, so... I mean, look, I, I am a believer, and I think a lot of academics agree that the Byzantine Empire, it is the continuation of the Roman Empire. The Byzantines were Romans. I know they were Greeks, but they were the inheritors of the Roman legacy. And so, you know, in reality, at least a part of the Roman Empire with the Byzantines really did last until the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. I know that is kind of controversial to say in popular discourse. A lot of people like to separate the two. But I feel like there is some academic recognition that, you know, the Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire. And now, of course, the Roman Empire of the year 1450 looks a lot different than the Roman Empire uh, of, you know, the 3rd century, for example. But the Roman Empire of the 3rd century looked a lot different from the Roman Empire of Augustus. So we're just seeing that extended evolution over time. And it definitely becomes something different but it is also the same thing evolving and changing. Instead of trying to pinpoint specific answers to a frankly impossible question, let's run through late imperial history to understand the fall as a process rather than any singular moment. Just yeah. a century after the death of Rome's favorite philosopher emperor, the sullen stoic Marcus Aurelius, the Pax Romana was shattered and the fall looked like it was coming any minute now. You could say that it was a lot of damage. But in came <laughs> Diocletian to flex tape the empire back together with a slate of reforms and at the turn of the 300s, things were looking solid. After 21 years and a whole lot of tape, Diocletian retired from being emperor, taking a well-earned rest at his Adriatic palace in direct emulation of the Republican hero Cincinnatus, who... Yeah. Well, we'll get to what happened, and then I'll make my point. ...saved Rome from crisis and then relinquished all his power to go home and farm. And then... Washington, George Washington, by the way, just a side note, was often called the American Cincinnatus, since he, you know, served as general and then retired and then was brought back for the presidency... Uh, and then did two terms and retired again. Uh, so that, that sort of, he was called the American Cincinnati because he filled that archetype of, you know, the successful statesman and general who did his job and then just wanted to retire, didn't want to hold power over everybody else. In the face of all the chaos from the past century, Diocletian's retirement was a monumental gesture, not only declaring that the empire was saved, but celebrating how Roman virtues had likewise survived. One thing Diocletian really didn't count on was that, in his absence, the Augusti and Caesares would immediately start fighting civil yeah. wars with each other. And this was the issue. And this is why George Washington had to come back. You know, Washington wanted to retire after he did his job, but unfortunately, he was just the only guy who could be the first president. We have a similar thing with Diocletian. Diocletian retires. Unfortunately, everything starts to fall apart when he goes. 
he very intelligently develops this system of governance, but it struggled to survive without him. I mean, you know what they say, when in Rome, sack it. <laughs> in the somewhat refreshing return to form where Rome's biggest enemy is just itself, a Western Augustus by the name of Constantine got to conquering his rival tetrarchs. You and I mean, if you know anything about Roman history, you will know which emperor came out on top. <laughs> you can guess what happens next, and the answer won't surprise you. In the fight for control of Italy and North Africa, he received a vision from an angel telling him to paint the symbol of Christ onto his army's shields. And let's be real here, if it's the fate of the empire, you're not in the business of saying no to angels, <laughs> so he got doodling and won the battle at the Milvian Bridge in 312. It's mm -hmm. unclear whether Constantine fully converted, but whatever the case, he was convinced enough that he legalized Christianity throughout the empire in 313 with the Edict of Milan. And, and there we go. This is the beginning of Christianity becoming the official Roman religion of state. ending its sporadic persecution. Now, toleration is different from incorporation, as mm -hmm. Christians had their one and only God who remained firmly separate from... Yeah, this is the beginning of Christianity as the religion of the Roman state. You know, we still have a while to go, but, you know... Constantine has sort of gotten the ball rolling. ...from the pagan pantheon, but as far as the state was concerned, they were both chill. Constantine's big hoist was to paint Christianity as compatible with a concept called Pax Deorum, where Rome gets divine favor if it's good and pious. So mm. whereas Christianity had earlier been seen as subversive, it could now be a team player. But the Eastern Empire was still controlled by a tetrarch who made the mistake of not being Constantine, so our boy <laughs> got to fixing that by conquering the rest of the empire in 324 and founding an Eastern capital named named Nova Roma, soon hmm. to be Constantinople. There we Constantine go. Constantine was more successful at economic reform than Diocletian, but he continued to rely on foreign mercenaries for much of Rome's defense. I think Constantine's an interesting figure. I see him sort of like Justinian in many ways. Both, uh, this sort of applies to both, but I'm going to talk about Constantine. Constantine was clearly a very talented and skilled and intelligent emperor, right? You can't deny that. But I think he was just sort of fighting against the historical forces of the time. He was a unifier. He united the empire under his sole rule. Unfortunately, you know, that just wasn't going to last. We've already passed the period when that was really tenable. Diocletian had the right idea. The empire has to be broken up for it to survive. And Constantine fights against that. But I just think he's fighting against the tide of history. I see Justinian in a very similar way. A very intelligent, uh, in some ways successful ruler who was fighting against the trends of history. And this will have unintended, albeit predictable, consequences over the next century. Through the yep. 300s, Rome held on. Administration was split between Rome and Constantinople. Sometimes there was one emperor, other times the job was shared. That one guy tried and failed to re outlaw Christianity. Big mess, but in the way. Yeah. Julian's an interesting fellow. Like of Constantine, things were loosely good, if a little uneasy. So as long as nobody comes to rock the book. <laughs> right. There's a lot we could unpack with the false dichotomy between civilized and savage, but mm. the simple fact is that the term barbarian was co-opted from Greek to describe all non-Romans. Yeah. And I think today we have a very moralized view of sort of barbarian versus civilized. And I'm not saying the Romans didn't. The Romans did. They viewed themselves as virtuous compared to non-Romans. But if we want to use these terms in a more objective manner, barbarian simply means non-Roman. Um, the Romans definitely attached other meanings to the word. They looked down on barbarians. They saw them as uncivilized. Uh, they thought they didn't have the culture or the institutions that the Roman world did. Um, so they viewed them negatively. But to us, barbarian just means non-Roman. Uh, I think we've, well, some of us haven't, but I hope a lot of us have sort of moved past this dichotomy of civilized and uncivilized. It's a lot more complicated than that. History is not a straight line of forward progress. Um, you know, it's, it's more complicated. But this is how the Romans saw it, and, and this is how we can interpret that for our own purposes in order to tell the history uh, in an accurate way while still understanding uh, the people of the time and what they were thinking. In centuries past, they were often allied with Rome to defend imperial territory, but the trouble started with the Huns to the northeast. When these aggressors pushed into new lands, they forced the current residents, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, lots of Goths, to... 
once again, Franks, Vandals, Goths, those who will survive after the fall of Rome, sort of creating medieval Europe, all of these peoples are being pushed further west because now the Huns are in town. And if you know anything about the Huns, they were relentless. It was extremely challenging to stop them. They kept moving west. And so all these different people groups are now forced to move west into Roman territory. Um, and now that Rome is faced with more security challenges, you know, we will see that the reunification of the empire is not going to last, at least not that long. To move somewhere else. The easiest and best option was usually into allied Roman territory. And just as back in the third century crisis, emperors often negotiated these relocations. So the image of barbarian invasions obscures what's more of an awkward and bloody but managed domino effect. This yeah, this is very true. Now, there certainly was a lot of aggression, there were a lot of battles, there were, you know, I mean, we're looking at these groups like the Vandals, but recognize that these are not monoliths. There's a lot of diversity within these groups. Um, so there was a lot of fighting, but the idea of like the barbarian invaders, I think is misleading. There were certainly some warlike barbarian invaders, but a lot of these barbarian invaders were people moving with their families to escape the conquest of the Huns. A lot of them did not intend to cause trouble or get into fights with Roman citizens or any of that. Um, but that's just sort of how it went after this, frankly, massive migration of peoples. Um, of course, it caused a lot of problems. But once again, the idea of the barbarian invasion is very complicated, but I think largely misleading. This explains why the push was so gradual and why these people became increasingly integrated into the military and political framework of Rome as vassal federati. Even yeah. in the most extreme examples, when they started carving their own entire kingdoms out of the provinces, it was done by treaty, under the auspices of Rome, in a remarkably similar arrangement to the Gallic and Palmyrene empires during the big crisis. Yeah, I mean, into the Dark Ages, into medieval Europe, when a lot of these European kingdoms are forming, um, a lot of them still pay tribute to the Romans. I mean, sometimes through an actual cash tribute, but more often through sort of a tribute to the Roman legacy, to Roman institutions. Long after Constantinople has any control of the Western provinces, the Franks and the Vandals and the Goths will still send letters to Constantinople talking about the glorious Roman Empire and recognizing the, the emperor's control over the provinces and all this stuff which practically isn't true at that point. But there's still a recognition of the history, the legacy, and the symbolism of Rome, of the Empire. That remains a long time after the on-the-ground reality has changed. So now that we have all these barbarians at the edge of and even inside the Roman world, I think it's time that we talk about, ahem, <clears throat> sax, baby. <laughs> and this, okay. like the rest, was a process, as some Goths out east wanted to run away from the Huns and get themselves some farmland, so per the terms of their treaty, they asked and received permission from Constantinople to cross the Danube into the Balkans. They were joined by some other Goths who were denied permission, but crossed anyway, and the <laughs> provincial generals treated them all so harshly that they rose in revolt, meeting the eastern army outside Adrianople. Yeah, exactly, and once again we see diversity within these groups. One group of Goths was allowed to pass and settle peacefully, one group of Goths was not, did anyway, and then that caused uh, a bit of a rebellion against the Roman power, and so it's, it's very complicated. ...in 378 and utterly thrashing them. Yet, after some more battles and negotiations, the result of all this was more federati. Perhaps yep. not surprising, because what choice did Rome have? Once again, the military had started to eclipse the power of the state, but instead of the legions and Roman generals of the late Republic, here the leverage belonged to the Federati and their kings. And what do armies do when they want something from the state? They march on Rome. See? Roman traditions. <laughs> Even well. So, yeah. in 410, the visit... In many ways, it's true. And I know this looks very different from what, you know, we saw in the early Republic. But... As I said, it's an evolution with time. Things will come to look very different, but that's just how it works. And uh, I think uh, they're right that a lot of these traditions and, and Roman legacies are continued, though they look very different, they've just evolved over time. The Goths made their request for more land and better treatment by the means of rolling up to the city and promptly sacking it. The damage was honestly minimal, but the notion that the ancient capital is now in striking distance was a real oh sh**. 
moment. Elsewhere in the early 400s, more Western territory slowly fell away as huge populations of Goths, Franks, and Vandals flowed in past the Rhine and Danube and converted Roman provinces into their own kingdoms. By yep. far the scariest of these were the Huns, who first arrived to torment the Empire around the turn of the century and landed on the city of Rome's doorstep in 452. <laughs> in comes Pope Leo I, who rode out to meet their leader Attila and persuade him with either words, a well-timed apparition of a couple angels, or the simple jingling of gold coins to kindly not destroy our empire, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the sort of traditional view that the sources give us is Pope Leo wrote out uh, and, you know, convinced Attila through the light of Christianity uh, and angels, uh, you know, for him to leave and, and leave the city in peace. But, uh, and no offense to anyone who might believe that, but I think if we look at this realistically and with an eye of skepticism, <laughs> we can probably say that it was more likely a, a tribute payment. I mean, that's what a lot of these uh, armies wanted when they marched upon Rome. They said, look, either we're going to sack your city, and that's going to result in a lot of deaths that you don't want, or you're going to pay us. So, you know, that's probably what actually happened. To literally everyone's surprise, Attila was convinced and withdrew from his campaign to get married and then immediately die. Now, of course, there may have been some other convincing. I'm not saying that religion didn't at all play a part in it, but... It it's definitely, at the very least, a combination of factors. Man, timing. The city's respite from invasion was brief, as soon came the Vandals in 455 to give Rome a proper sacking. Like, vandalized. Pope Leo had less <laughs> diplomatic success this time around, persuading yep. the Vandals not to kill people or destroy stuff on the condition that they could plunder anything or anyone they wanted. Still pretty bad. <laughs> With all the Federati yeah. getting out of hand in the western part of the Roman Empire, what about the east? Well, back in the 390s, Emperor Theodosius reigned with two trends that Constantine had started. First was mandating Nicene Christianity as Rome's official religion, which sounds pretty extreme, but in practice was one step in a long and steady process of mm -hmm. Christianization. Starting... Yep, uh, and this is going to start a lot of issues where the Roman state establishes religious orthodoxy they say this is the version of christianity we should follow uh, and this is what it says and this is what it means and then you know we get heretics springing up throughout the empire and by heretics we just mean christians who have a different view of christianity um and of course this is a christian tradition in itself uh, christians arguing with other christians we have eastern orthodox versus catholics we have protestants versus catholics you know, we have a lot of these issues uh, over time, uh, and this is sort of the beginning of that, where the Roman state is in charge of religious orthodoxy, and then a lot of people disagree. ...from big urban power centers and spreading out to the countrysides over the course of centuries. His other move was having his two sons each inherit half of the empire. Now, we've seen this happen before, and even since the Tetrarchy, the East and West had separate imperial courts, but this division would prove to be permanent. The timing mm -hmm. was unfortunate because things swiftly got rough for the West, but this alone <laughs> didn't doom them. Rather, it highlights some core issues that started to stack up. The West was poorer and less urbanized, it had a far longer border to defend, and was almost fully reliant on Federati for their armies. Yeah, and we've seen this transition over time. We've seen power shift to the east, wealth shift to the east. I mean, remember, in the east we have the traditional lands of Greece, uh, and we have Egypt. You know, we, we have a lot of really wealthy uh, areas with a long history of culture, prosperity, traditions. Um, and the West has just slowly become weaker over time, the longer border, all these enemies on their borders, now a lot of these enemies moving inwards, um, you know, just a lot of these issues have developed over time, and we've seen them develop, and they will lead to the fall of the West. So when strained legions had to prioritize the defense of Italy, Britannia and Gaul quickly fell away, and soon went Hispania and North Africa along with them, leading to the kind of death spiral that would make even Aurelian terrified. <laughs> Gang, I don't think this Orbis can be restitutored, because in less than a century, the Roman Empire had gone from this to this. So, mm. how about we call it? The armies of King Odoacer conquered Italy and deposed the 16-year-old Emperor Romulus Augustulus, sending word to the Eastern Roman Empire Zeno that he had assumed control of the Western Empire on your behalf. To which Constantinople said, I didn't ask you to do that, but thank you? Right, and so... This will start a relatively long tradition of um, 
you know, different groups, whether they be goths or vandals or whatever, ruling these territories. But like I mentioned earlier, <laughs> they still pay tribute to Constantinople. So Odoacer, um, some people do see him as sort of a Western emperor. Many do not. Whatever you think of that, he still fits himself into that system. He still pays tribute to Constantinople. He still says, yes, of course, uh, the Roman Empire and Constantinople is supreme, and I'm, I'm just playing a role in that. So a lot of these things continue long after the, you know, reality has changed. Because, of course, Rome has no control over the Western provinces, and as time goes on, they will lose the little control they have. But there's still sort of these symbolic remnants of the empire. To which Odoake responded, you're welcome. <laughs> and with that, the Western Roman Empire had transformed into a series of Frankish and Gothic kingdoms, and Italy was ruled by non-Romans for the first time in 700 years. Unfortunately for our ability to easily categorize history into Rome and not Rome, 476 <laughs> is less solid of an endpoint than we yep. might expect. The entity that was the Roman Empire had collapsed like the Republic before it, and a millennium-spanning state based in the Italian peninsula did indeed go poof, but the concept of a singular empire had already been dead for two yep. centuries, and yep. Romans across the Mediterranean were already learning how to have Roman culture without a Roman state. This is exactly true. Rome survives past the collapse of the Roman state. And, and they have it on screen right now through things like laws, language, identity, religion with Christianity, culture. These things survive the collapse of the Roman state. And like I said, even, uh, you know, these barbarian rulers like Odoacer still see themselves as a part of this Roman system. So it's really fuzzy, really complicated, and I find it really fascinating. Even so, that culture had shifted as Rome transformed from pagan to Christian. Meanwhile, the Federati had thoroughly blurred the line between barbarian and Roman and were more often happy to preserve Roman institutions in their new kingdoms, yep. like Gothic kings of Italy retaining and even empowering the mm -hmm. Senate. Looking ahead, the Mediterranean world would remain fundamentally Roman in character until the arrival of Islam in the 600s. So just as Rome had created an empire long before Augustus became its first proper monarch, the death of the Roman Empire lands both earlier and later than the last emperor's overthrow. Late yep. antiquity is absolutely fascinating, but it sure as hell is not easy to categorize. Yeah, it's fascinating, but it's so complicated. <laughs> it's incredibly complicated. Um, and of course, as we move uh, into the Dark Ages and medieval Europe, it gets even more complicated. That's for my expertise. Well, not expertise. I'm not an expert on this. That's for my knowledge ends, right? I know a bit about Rome. Once, you know, we reach the traditional collapse of the West, though we've talked about how that's not really an accurate way of putting it, you know, I really begin to lose a lot of my knowledge of the Western world. I don't know much about the Dark Ages or Western Europe, um, but a lot of these trends remain, and it's just incredibly complicated. <laughs> I mean, if you're a historian of, say, the Dark Ages or medieval Europe, hey, shout out to you, because there are so many different polities governments, kingdoms, rulers. There's just a lot going on. Uh, it was, in many ways, a lot more simple back in the days of Augustus. <laughs> we have one empire under one guy. You know, it's sort of a lot easier to categorize. So we have kind of a when and a few whys for the fall of Rome, but it's a testament to Rome's strength and flexibility that it survived this long at all. It should have been conquered by Hannibal during the Punic Wars, it should have fractured in the late Republic with the carousel of military dictatorships, and it should have collapsed during the five-pronged crisis of the third century. And while on one level any civilization founded on continuous conquest will run into extreme difficulty when that expansion stops, we should recognize that much as the Republic had faltered, the unified empire was similarly no longer longer cutting it. So Rome did what it does best, and adapted. While the Empire died, parts of Rome very much lived on, via the yeah. Byzantine Empire in the East, the Christian Church and the Pope in Rome, the Romance languages and intangibles like literature, the culture of laws, and the platonic ideal of what it means to be an empire. Yeah, and these are all things that claim the legacy of Rome. Of these, I think, the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, has the best claim to Roman legacy. I mean, it is a continuation of the Roman Empire, and it would last until the 1400s. That's how long we're talking. But even in the West, you know, we have the Catholic Church and the creation much later of the Holy Roman Empire, you know, 
while I think these things have a much weaker claim to Roman legacy, they are still drawing on that Roman tradition. And then not to mention the language, the laws, the literature. You know, a lot of Roman law is the basis for the law that much of Europe still follows today. So it's really, it's really fascinating. There's a reason the question of why and how Rome fell fascinates and even haunts us. It's this megalithic, world-conquering, seemingly immortal civilization totally thrashed by a confluence of factors. And any society can see a little bit of themselves in the fall of Rome. Now, permit me to get philosophical here, but the mm. fall isn't the sad ending to an otherwise pristine civilization, yeah. rather a constant process that began the instant Romulus gave his city a name. And there Yeah, the fall is not this climactic, disastrous collapse of uh, a glorious and pristine empire that was there one day and gone the next. As we've seen throughout this video, <laughs> there is very much... I guess both a deterioration and an evolution of the Empire over time. That's really how it was. Their frequent failures remained inextricable from their great successes, as they overcame unrelenting crises throughout their history by learning from their weaknesses, thinking practically, and adapting. From kingdom, to republic, to empire, to papacy. The fall was always there, but so was Rome. Thank you so, wow. so, so much for watching. I spent way longer working on this than I probably should have, but... Alright, I'm gonna end it there. Um, I spent way longer reacting to this than I probably should have. I think this is the longest video <laughs> on the channel. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time. I'm at about an hour and 20 minutes. If you're still here, geez, well, thank you. <laughs> um... You, you don't have something better to do? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I appreciate that you've stuck with me through this. Um, I really, really enjoyed this video. I could break it up into two parts, but I'm not going to do that. I'll just keep it as one. Uh, it'll be nice having such a long video on the channel. <laughs> uh, if anybody ever asks, Hey, Ethan, uh, you know, what's your opinion on the Roman Empire? I just direct them to this. Say, this hour and 20 minutes, this is my opinion on the Roman Empire. Uh, you can find virtually everything I'm ever going to say on it. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, that was a really long recording session. Um, my voice hurts, to be honest with you. Uh, I had a really good time, though. I really enjoyed this one. I'm definitely going to do uh, Overly Sarcastic Productions video on the Roman Republic resummarized because they did an excellent job with this one. I should say, uh, I've talked about my commentary, they did a fantastic job. This was a great video. Um, I mean, it was good in terms of accuracy, but I loved the way they approached it and the arguments they made and the points they were making. Um, it really aligns with my perspective on the Roman Empire. And I think, it, you know, I think this is the most sort of accurate way to look at the empire is sort of evolution over time. I think that's really how it was, but it's endlessly complex and I don't want to get into another discussion about it. I'm going to end it here. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this really long video. I had a great time. If you're still around, I'd, I'd very much appreciate it if you would become a channel member. Just click the join button next to the subscribe button and hit the subscribe button while you're there. Uh, follow me on Twitter. That's in the description below. Leave a like, leave a comment. Uh, check me out on Patreon. All that good stuff's in the description. I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.